Isn't that a blessing, Brother Ron? Amen. I love it. I love it. All right, let's go ahead and get started tonight. We're in chapter two, or our second study, third study, I guess, but basically the second level, you might say. And uh, I'm kind of dragging my feet a minute, waiting on Pete to get in here, because he's so lit up about this, I didn't want to miss any of it. There he comes. He's waiting on you, Pete. <laughs> Well, I hope there was a lot of it. There you go. So we're going to start our study tonight of the dispensations. Now, if you have a handout, there are, to the best of my capability of my study, there are eight dispensations that we find in Scripture. Now, of course, our... It's on... There we go. Always something. <laughs> Technical difficulties. Yeah, I need some water, right? Anyway. We'll catch up with the slides here in a minute. But anyway, as you know, the, there we go. Our, our verse for this whole study is 2 Timothy 2.15, which says, Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed. Notice, rightly dividing the word of truth. So Paul clearly tells Timothy that there are divisions in Scripture. And you might say, well, I don't believe that. Well, you have 66 basic divisions already in each book. Then you have two other divisions between the Old Testament and the New Testament. Then each one has chapters, each one has verses, so on and so forth. So there are basic divisions that we already see. But if we don't understand these divisions of Scripture, the Scriptures become very confusing. They become very, for lack of a better way to put it, non-doctrinal. Because what happens is, we begin to take, try to take everything in the Bible and cram it into a point where we have to follow everything between <laughs> both covers. And that gets very difficult because some of it was written, as we learned last week, to who? The Jew. Some written to the Gentile. And other parts of it written to the church. So we see that base, those three basic divisions that we talked about last week. But tonight we're going to talk about dispensations. Now, a dispensation is defined as this. The defining of events under divine authority. Now, what does that mean? Well, it's a real fancy way of saying this. Is that it's how God dealt with people during a certain time frame. The defining of events under divine authority. This is a dispensation. So a dispensation, again, is a time frame. And as we go through Scripture, you'll find that there are basically eight time frames. And this, these time frames are divided up into uh, known time. Let's put it that way. In so many words, from Genesis 1 to Revelation 22. It's divided up into eight basic time frames. But the other thing that you have to look at, too, is that there's an eternity past, which happened before Genesis 1-1, and there will be an eternity future, which happens after Revelation 22. We don't think about that, do we? We really don't. But folks, when we got saved, we got saved for how long? Forever. So there has to be an eternity future. How long has God existed? So there has to be an eternity past. He always has been, and He always will be. That's a blessing, isn't it? That's how powerful our God is. Now, we find in Scripture that dispensations have different names. 
you'll find in 1 Corinthians 9, 17, Ephesians 1, 10, and Ephesians 3, 2, you will find the word dispensation in Scripture. So we know that it's a scriptural um, doctrine. It's a scriptural process. The word dispensation is found in Scripture. The next thing you'll find is it's referred to as ages. Ages. Paul said in the ages to come, talking about time frame. And then again, we find another one that in 1 Thessalonians 5, 2, we can see it referred to as days. In this particular passage, it talks about the day of the Lord. And I could get into a lot of other stuff about time frames right now that would totally blow your mind, but I'm not going to do that tonight. I'll give you one small one. How long is a week? Seven days. In the scripture, it can be defined as seven days, but it can also be defined as seven years. Seven years can define a week. You say, where's that found? Daniel, where else? I can tell you how to define it. Mike? That's it. Remember what their father told Jacob? Fulfill their week. And how long did he serve for each one? Seven years. So you see it defines a week as how long? Seven years. You can also find in Daniel it can be referred to as 70 weeks. And we talk about that in Daniel. But then again, when you start looking at it, it's very confusing in trying to make that apply to 70 weeks of days versus 70 weeks of years. So a lot of different time frames are mentioned in Scripture, and we won't get into all that today. Now, dispensations are determined scripturally by how God deals with mankind during a certain time frame in relationship to sin and man's responsibility to that sin. So, let me clarify that statement. With Abraham, did he deal with man and man's sin the same way that he deals with us today? No, he didn't. Did he with the Old Testament Jew? No, he didn't. Because, look at it this way, if, if he did... We would have a whole pile of dead animals and blood and guts and burnt altar and everything else going on here. You talk about a bloody religion and a bloody mess, man. Can you imagine what that tabernacle and temple had to look like? Or what it smelled like? Brother Ron, you would know. Well, I'm just being practical about it. Brother Ron worked in a slaughterhouse for a long time. He understands. It's a mess. And that's what the tabernacle and the temple had to look like. Can you imagine what the priest had to look like when, I mean, after slaying all those animals, blood spraying everywhere? And it, it was a bloody mess, man. No, Dan? It's a matter of debate on how that worked. Um, some people believe that the priest slayed the animal. Other people believe that the person who brought the animal to the sacrifice actually slayed it. So, um, because it, in one place it talks about when they brought the sacrifice into the temple, the one who offered it had to lay his hand on the head of the sacrifice. So there, there's some... They, it, it was a blood sacrifice they gave to atone for their sin. But the thing of it was there were different sacrifices. And it wasn't a permanent sacrifice because the Bible said they had to come year after year after year after year after year. Whereby accepting the shed blood of Jesus Christ, we don't have to come every year. We come one time to Christ. And Christ saves us how many times? Once. One time. Isn't that a blessing? The Old Testament priest had to enter into the Holy Holies of the tabernacle every year. 
Here's an interesting thought. Do you realize that the high priest had pomegranates and bells on the bottom of his robe? Do you know why? He literally jingled when he walked with the bells. He jingled. When he went into the Holy of Holies, if he wasn't right with God, what would happen? He was struck dead. You know what the, and they tied a rope around his ankle for that. So as long as they heard the jingling of the bells, they knew he was okay. But as soon as the bells quit tinkling, uh, boys, we got a problem. But Jesus Christ entered how, how many times in the heavenly holy of holies? One time. That was sufficient. So, you see, as God deals differently with man's sin and his relationship with that sin, this determines different dispensations through the Scripture. Each biblical dispensation, notice this, ends in judgment. Judgment. Let's talk about the first dispensation, man innocent, or the Adamic dispensation. So by the name, the theological term of Adamic, guess who it deals with? Adam. This dispensation would be preceded by eternity past. There are too many references to list <laughs> concerning eternity past, and we'll deal with that at some other time. I was telling Brother Pete about part of it before class, and he kind of looked at me like, what? <laughs> it, it's a very deep study in eternity past, and we'll talk about that some other time. But it begins with the creation of Adam. Adam's chronology dates us at about 4004 B.C. Now, how many of you know who Usher is or was? Usher was a, a, a member of, the, of Scotland Yard. He was a detective. And he went through the Bible and he worked out the dates of when things would have happened by year. And as he worked back through Scripture, he found out that the creation of Adam would have been around 4004 B.C. Now, we know that B.C. stands for before Christ. But what's interesting is we know that Christ died when, or was, I'm sorry, not died, but was born when. You would think it'd be 0 A.D., which does not stand for after death. It stands for Anno Domini, which means in the year of our Lord. But if you look at Usher's chronology, he was born at 4 B.C. The reason that is is because if you take a Roman calendar and try to apply it into a Jewish calendar, the two are off by how much? Four years which means that Christ did not die in 33 and a half A.D. Christ would have died at 29 and a half A.D. But it would have took a guy a whole lot smarter than me to figure this out, so I look at Usher. If you have a Schofield Reference Bible, in the center column they have the references in the center. At the top of the page, there's normally a list of the dates that Usher worked out, and that's based on Usher's chronology. So you'll find that in a Schofield Reference Bible. Man's failure during this dispensation was what? Adam could do anything he wanted to, but one thing, what was it? That's it. And what happened? He fell. He fell. Adam fell. Adam and Eve fell because they ate of the fruit of the knowledge of good and evil, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And the judgment is in Genesis 3, 15 through 24. Let's look at that passage real quick. Genesis 3, 15. Now let's start in verse 14. The Bible says, And the Lord God said unto the serpent, Because thou hast done this, thou art cursed above all cattle and above every beast of the field. Upon thy belly shalt thou go, and dust shalt thou eat all the days of thy life. Now think about it for a minute. We've always looked at a serpent as one that crawls on the ground, right? Snake, basically. But in this point, what does it say? It says, upon thy belly shalt thou go. 
It's almost like the serpent at one, when he was originally created, had what? Had legs. It's an amazing thing. Now look at verse 15. And I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. We'll go into a study on that sometime, but it's actually a reference to Jesus Christ, and we'll talk about that some other time. 16. Under the woman, he said, I will greatly multiply thy sorrow and thy conception. In sorrow thou shalt bring forth children, and thy desire shall be to thy husband, and he shall rule over thee. So ladies, you can blame the serpent and blame Eve. It's part of the judgment of the Adamic curse. 17. And unto Adam he said, Because thou hast hearkened unto the voice of thy wife, and hast eaten of the tree of which I commanded thee, saying, Thou shalt not eat of it, cursed is the ground for thy sake. In sorrow shalt thou eat of it all the days of thy life. Thorns and thistles shall it bring forth to thee, and thou shalt eat the herb of the field. In the sweat of thy face shalt thou eat bread, till thou return unto the ground. For out of it wast thou taken, for dust thou art, and unto dust thou shalt return. Now, what's interesting about that is this. Prior to them sinning, prior to them eating of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, Adam and Eve were eternal. They knew no sin. They were perfect. They were created in the image and likeness of God. They knew no sin. But after they sinned, by what? Disobedience. It wasn't the actual act of eating it. It was the act of disobedience. One thing, that's all they had to do, one thing, and they blew it. And because of that, judgment came. And what did God tell them? He said, the day that thou eatest of it, thou shalt, what? Surely die. Did they drop dead when they ate it? They did not die physically, but they died how? Spiritually, right? Yeah. And as time passed, they aged and they died. And we're sinners because of the sin nature that's passed on to us from our parents. That was passed to them from our grandparents, the great parents, so on and so forth, and be traced all the way back to Adam and Eve. The reason you're a sinner is this. It's genetics. It's pretty simple, isn't it? We have, we have that sin nature this is a wild thought. We have that sin nature because it's been passed on to us all the way back to Adam and Eve. But the funny thing of it is this. It's not our natural state. Our natural state would be how man was created. And man was created in the image and likeness of God. So by how we are now, we are actually in an unnatural state. See? Because we're what? Sinners, and we are not how man was originally created. Do you all understand all of that? It means I'm doing a good job, don't I? Now, now you begin. Yeah, Dennis. No, but God told them verbally, right, not to do it. And how was the Bible basically inspired? It was told verbally to M Moses. Was, a lot of it was dictated to him. And a lot of the New Testament was dictated through the New Testament authors. But if you stop it, it wouldn't be where we are today. I'm sorry? If God had stopped them from eating from the forbidden fruit. Mm-hmm. He could have. But the thing of it is, is that we have a free will. We've always had the free will to do right or wrong. You have the right to do this or right to do that. It's totally up to you. And God's always allowed you to have that free will. So, Jim? Right. 
Right. a crazy thing. But you know what's funny is, is that when, the, when, the, when Satan tempted Adam, or tempted Eve with the fruit of the tree, he misquoted what God had told them to do. It was a misquote of the Word of God. You know why it's important that we stay in this book? So that we know when Scripture is being quoted truthfully or wrongly. And that's why it's important that we learn about these dispensations so that we can rightly divide the word of truth and rightly apply Scripture. If you remember one thing that I said earlier in this, in this class is this. Every, every false doctrine is a truth misapplied. So in so many words, was there a time through Scripture when a person could lose their salvation? Absolutely. But can we lose it now? No. So what they're doing is they're taking verses that apply to a different dispensation and trying to apply them to you now. Does that make sense? Every heresy is a truth misplaced. Yes. That's it. The thing is, I couldn't understand it. And I asked somebody this time, and he was asking about this one. He said, you know, I can kind of tell me, you know what I kind of do? I ask the Lord to show me how. Eternal life. Exactly. That's it. You know what's interesting about that, Ron? We're where? In the palm of his hand, am I right? You want to know what's really cool? There's another passage in Scripture, and I can't remember where it's at right now. There's another one that says we're covered by His hand. You don't remember when your kids used to catch lightning bugs? How'd you hold them? Right? You know what? We're in His hand, and we're covered by His hand. You can't get out if you wanted to. Isn't that cool? But now you start to see why dispensations are important. Am I right? Second one. Man under conscience. Man under conscience. Every man did that which was right in his own eyes. There was no legal system. There was no... God had not instituted law... God had not given any commandment past this. Every man did that which was right in his own eyes. Righteousness was determined by man's own conscience. However, man didn't what? Follow his conscience. You say, well, how is that capable? How many times do you not follow your conscience? You know there's something you shouldn't do, but what do you do? What did Paul say? That which I would not that do I, right? He went through that whole dissertation and it's about what? Not following your conscience. Man's failure, Genesis 6, 5 through 6, and the judgment was the flood.
Remember what God told Noah? He said what? He said, it repents me that I've made man. He said, I can't deal with it anymore. Man is so wicked, he could, everyone was doing what? That which was right in his own eyes. And man did not follow his conscience. And therefore, God had to totally, the judgment that he brought was what? Total annihilation of mankind except for eight people. The third would be man in authority over the earth, which would be the Noahic, or based on who? Noah. Noah. This dispensation would be determined by Noah and his family. Look at Genesis chapter 9. And verse 1 through 2 says this, And God blessed Noah and his sons, and said unto them, Be fruitful, and multiply, and replenish the earth. Isn't that interesting, Brother Pete? Right back to what you and I were talking about before church, what did God tell Adam? Go forth, multiply, and what? Replenish. Not plentish, but what? Re- which tells me there had to be something here before before Adam. Isn't that weird? Now the mind, i just seen everybody's smoke come out of everybody's ears and minds just totally blow apart, right? We'll talk about that some other time. But what did he tell Noah? Multiply and replenish the earth. And the fear of you and the dread of you shall be upon every beast of the earth and upon every fowl of the air, upon all that moveth upon the earth and upon all the fishes of the sea into your hand are they delivered. So Noah was basically given rule of what? Everything. Everything on the face of the earth, Noah was given total control of. You ever wonder why you can't pet an animal, a wild animal, why they won't come up to you and everything? It's right there. And the fear of you and the dread of you. It's a fear that God has instilled in animals to be afraid of man. And it's based on the Noahic covenant. But man's failure was an attempt to be like God. And when did this happen? At the Tower of Babel. What did they say? We'll build a tower, right? And be as high as God. They thought they could build a tower to the heavens. Boy, were they wrong. Were they wrong? You know what's interesting? If you're saved, we're going to heaven when we die. Right? Or at the rapture of the church. We're going to heaven. You say, where's heaven? I don't have a clue where it is. You say, well, it's up. Yeah, but on the other side of the earth, up is that way. Right? But I don't have to worry where it is, Brother Leonard. You know why? Because Jesus Christ will come and take me home. And he'll come and take you home. Yeah, Ron. Mm-hmm. No doubt. That's it. That's it. You know, we talk about um, ladies who've had miscarriages. We talked about that at lunchtime with Matt and Jeannie. We had lunch with them. And you know, the funny thing of it is, I believe those children are in glory. Uh, those that have been have died by abortion, they're in glory. I have no doubt about it. Because I believe that life starts at conception. And, and if you don't, 
Better get in your book. But look here. Jerry and I have always said we have 17 grandkids, but actually we have six in heaven through, you know, miscarriages that have happened. And, hey, I like what my daughter said. My oldest daughter said this, and it, I'll never forget it. She said, well, Daddy, she said, we'll just have to trust Grandma to take care of them until we get there. You know what that's called? That's total faith. Ricky? When my mother died, my mom and dad had had a stillbirth. Their first child was a stillbirth. And my mother had passed away. Our dad had been gone a long time. And Mother's Day, my sister called me. My sister and I are very close. And the next Mother's Day after my mother had passed away, uh, my sister called me and she was kind of upset and, you know, missing mom and everything. And the, the stillborn baby was a boy and they named it Robert. And Robert Lee Cottrell. And with all that being said, my sister was, you know, kind of bemoaning the fact that mom was gone, that we didn't have her for Mother's Day anymore. I said, sis, I said, let, I said, let Robert have a Mother's Day. It's total faith. And we have to understand these things are true. These things are real. And if you believe in Jesus Christ and you know you're saved, you believe the book, you, this is the kind of faith we're talking about. Let's get back to this. Man's failure was an attempt to be like God at, at the Tower of Babel. And of course, we know the judgment was what? He confused their languages and, the man, and mankind was scattered. I give you a weird thought, Brother Pete. You ready for this? I think weird stuff when I read the Bible. When I study the book, I get weird thoughts. But have you ever noticed how all the continents could fit together? Did you ever notice that? How in the world would he have scattered mankind all the way around the world and all these different continents and everything? Like how did the Indians get to North America? Did you ever think about that stuff? When he scattered those people, you know what I think he could have done? He could have split the continents apart. I'm not saying it's Bible. I'm just saying it's an interesting thought. So don't go out of here and saying, Brother David said this through the Scripture. I didn't say that. I said it's an interesting thought. Okay? Yes. And it could be. Yes, that's it. <laughs> but see, but you know what you guys are starting to do right now? You're applying dispensational truth, whether you believe it or realize it or not. You're, say, you're seeing all these things. You're saying, it's like, hey, this, you're applying dispensational truth. Isn't that awesome? It's absolutely phenomenal. To hear people begin to apply this this quickly, who 20 or 30 minutes ago had no idea what a dispensation was. Ron? Pardon me. Yeah, it's, and, and you know what I have to say? God has a sense of humor. Can you imagine how crazy this had to be with the confusion and all that? And God had to be just sitting up there laughing. I just think it's funny.
Yeah. <laughs> I, I just think this is so cool. This stuff just fascinates me. Now let's look at the next one, number four, man under promise. And if you notice, these things are moving kind of quick. Moving kind of quick. This is also known as the Abrahamic dispensation, which would deal with who? There you go. It's based on covenant between God and man. Some promises unconditional. Some promises conditional. In so many words, what God did on the conditional promises, He said, if you do this, then I'll do this. But man failed to keep his end of the bargain. Isn't that the way it always is? And the judgment was what? The Egyptian bondage. Now, Abraham had a son, had two sons, right? Mm hmm. And who were his two sons? I'm sorry? Abraham's two sons were who? Yep. And Jacob, right, became who? After the, after the bondage, what, what did God change his name to? There you go. So is Israel here yet? There is no nation of Israel at this point yet. The fifth would be man under law, which is also known as the Mosaic dispensation, which would deal with who? Moses. So what happened? Egyptian bondage, 400 years, released, right? Head to the promised land. They have a few issues. Spent 40 years in the wilderness. And during that time, God and Moses had some very serious conferences, right? Very serious conversations. And he came down from Mount Sinai with a tablet with ten, the Ten Commandments. But it was more than the Ten Commandments. There was so many more. Because if you read through Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, there are just a ton of commandments and, and regulations that God put on the nation of Israel. He spelled out to them all the sacrifices, how the temple or the tabernacle was to be established, who the priesthood was to be, the, 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 uh, the, Levi, the Levites. He talked about how their robes were to be put together. He talked about how the tabernacle was to be built. He talked about all, every, all these things. It's crazy, all the stuff that God dealt with them. And the promise of law from God, the nation of Israel, the promise of law from God, and the nation of Israel accepted it. And they said this, all that thou sayest, we will do. Well, guess what, Ron? They didn't do it. I've heard people say this. I've heard Christians say, oh, I tell you what, if we had it like Israel had it, we'd have it made. You know what? You couldn't keep, you couldn't obey the Old Testament law any more than they could. You think they had it made, buddy, I'll tell you what, we really got it made. Now, man failed in the utter rejection of the law and by following other gods. Oh, yeah. I mean, the nation of Israel, they caused their children to pass through the fire. Do you know what that means? They sacrificed them to Moloch through fire. They burnt their children alive as sacrifices. Isn't that crazy? It is. It's nuts. Yeah. 
You know what we're doing? You know what's happened since 1973? Same thing. All those children have been sacrificed on the altar of convenience. The judgment was this. Captivity under Nebuchadnezzar in Babylon and the dispersion which continues unto this day and, four, and then they had 400 years of silence from Malachi to Matthew. You know what happened to the nation of Israel? They were scattered. Ron? Yeah. And one of the judgments that God brought against Egypt was what? The Passover. And what happened at the Passover? The firstborn was the firstborn died. So all through this mosaic dispensation goes all the way now, we're all the way through the Old Testament and up into the Gospels. Now, if you remember last week, we got into this crazy discussion about the book of Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Matthew, Mark, and Luke are still, for all intents and purposes, from a, from a dispensation standpoint, still under the Mosaic dispensation. Because the new dispensation doesn't start until when? According to the book of Hebrews, it doesn't start until the death of the testator. So the nation of Israel was still under the Mosaic law up until the death of Christ, who's the testator of the New Testament. So when does the New Testament start? At the death of, which happens in Matthew 26. That's a new thought for a lot of people, isn't it? So we have this transition that we're talking about. We have a transition that happens in the Gospels from Old Testament law to New Testament grace. And these are huge. These are huge. Things really change at this point. Old Testament law to New Testament grace. Man, aren't you glad that happened? The next thing that happens is the emphasis changing from God the Father to God the Son. You say, are there instances of, of Jesus being mentioned in the Old Testament? Oh, you bet. There's appearances by Christ in the Old Testament that are referred to as a theophany. Do you remember the angel that Jacob had a wrestling match with? I'll give you one. Christ was in the womb physically, right? But yet Mary and Joseph were following what? A star. Guess who that was? You say, can Christ be two places at one time? He's God. He can be anywhere he wants to be at the same time. Remember what he said before Abraham was? Present tense. Time does not hold him back in any way, shape, or form. He's in the past. He's in the present. He's in the future. I'm sorry? Sure. Exactly. So we start seeing these transition things happen. The emphasis changing from one nation. I'm sorry. We had a typo there. Emphasis changing from one nation, Israel, to the world. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Salvation no longer is based on what man did. Isn't that a blessing? But now is based on what Jesus Christ had finished or completed. Do you remember what he said on the cross just before he died? It is finished. And he wasn't talking about his life, was he? Because three days later, what happened? He's walking around again. So his life wasn't finished, but what was finished? The work of redemption on the cross. Pretty cool, huh? Now, 
This is the age or the dispensation that we now find ourselves, the age of grace. And it's 10 after 6. You don't want to keep going or you want to do some more next week? Keep going. Okay. <laughs> I mean, I'll do whatever. All right, let's talk about the age of grace. Right now, we are under the age of grace. We are saved by grace. For by grace are ye saved through faith. That not of yourselves is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. It's not what we do, it's what he's done. We have a religion of done, not what we have to do. That might be a little hard to see. But this dispensation is based on the sacrificial gift of Jesus Christ, shedding his blood on the cross of Calvary, and mankind accepting the free gift of eternal life. Salvation or righteousness is not based on what man does, but on the grace and mercy of Jesus Christ. That's where we are today. Aren't you glad you were saved or born in this dispensation? This is the easiest dispensation to develop a relationship with Christ. You say, how easy, how easy is it? Lord, I'm just an old sinner and I need to be saved and I ask you to forgive me, come into my heart and life and be my Lord and Savior. In Jesus Christ's name, amen. It's that simple. It's that simple. People try to make more to it than there is, and it's not. It's by His grace, by His merit, by His favor, by His blood, what He has done, not what we can do. And up to this point, all the other dispensations we've looked at are based on what? Meant what man had to do, not what God had done. See the difference? This all making sense? Yep. You're going to see it here in just a minute. Man under grace is based on his mercy, Titus 3 5. For according to his mercy, he saved us. You know what mercy is? A merited favor. This dispensation ends with the apostasy of the church. And ladies and gentlemen, we are getting very, very, very close. This deals, this dispensation ends with the apostasy of the church. 2 Thessalonians 2, 1 through 3. And with the rapture of the church, 1 Corinthians 15, 52 through 58, 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 through 18, and Revelation 4, 1. Now look here. In Revelation chapter 4, this is fascinating to me. This is crazy. If you go to the book of Revelation and you look at chapters 1, 2, and 3, they deal with what? The seven churches. And, they were, and each one of those was written to a local church. Y'all get it? Then what happens in chapter 4, verse 1? Christ tells John to what? Come up hither and I will show you things which must shortly come to pass. Come up, it's a picture of the rapture of the church. At the end of the church, boom. Say that again, Kenny, I'm sorry. That means the church as a whole is raptured out. Yep. It's exact. He said, so what you're saying is the church as a whole is raptured out, and the answer is yes, we are. And the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. And you know what verse 18 says? Wherefore comfort one another with these words. Yeah. What, did he, what was the curse on Adam? Adam? 
Yeah, from the, from the dust thou was created to the dust thou shalt return. So, here's something I want to point out. The word rapture does not appear in Scripture. But, what's that? Yes, it does. But what's interesting is this. The word rapture, or the definition of the word rapture is the state of being carried away with joy, love, etc. Buddy, I'll tell you what. When the trumpet blows, we're going to be carried away, and I'm going to be carried away with joy and love and all those things. And if that doesn't define the word rapture, I don't know what does. Yeah. It's a word to explain a doctrine. Well, okay, let's call it caught up. That's scripture, right? Now, the tribulation, to what Brother Jim was just asking about. Some people do not consider the tribulation a dispensation, but I do. Because God deals with mankind in a different way during those seven years than he does at any other time. That is what we refer to as we began this study as what? The definition of a dispensation. So therefore, I feel the tribulation is a dispensation. Now, salvation in the tribulation. Here you go, Brother Jim. Salvation in the tribulation is based on, A, accepting Christ as Savior. So they have to accept Christ. But in the tribulation, that's not enough. Because you'll also find they have to keep the law and the sacrifices. Hang on a minute, Ron. So they have to accept Christ. Then they have to keep the law and the sacrifices. But not only that, they have to endure to the end. Because what's it say in Matthew 24? They that endure to the end, the same shall be saved. Endure to the end of what? To the end of the tribulation. But you know what's going to happen to Christianity in tribulation? They're going to be hunted down. They're going to be butchered. They're going to be beheaded. They're, I mean, all these things are going to happen, man. Yeah, Ron. Yes. Yes. Mm-hmm. So, and another way of being saved during the tribulation is not, you, you can't take the mark of the beast. Here's an interesting thought, Jim. You ready for this one? Where's the mark of the beast happen? You know what it says in Matthew 24, I believe? If thy eye offend thee, where's the eyes? If thy hand offend thee, wonder why he would tell people to do that. Get rid of the mark of the beast, man. Get rid of the mark of the beast. The tribulation could be referred to as another transition period, but I think not. I'd rather see it referred to as another dispensation completely. So in the trib, man, it is going to be a disaster. Well, I'll just hang out and I'll make it to the end. No, you won't. No, you won't. They'll know. Look at here. They know where you are right now, whether you like it or not. You know why? How many of you have one of these in your pocket? You realize they can locate you within a three-foot circle with that thing in your hand? Yeah. It's called triangulation. All they have to do is hook into three different cell towers and they can pinpoint your location within three feet with that thing in your pocket. Yeah. You see, the tribulation is not anything to play with. But you know what? But I'll be gone. Yes, I'll be gone. When the tribulation enters, I'll be gone. <laughs> Amen. 
Now, the next one is the millennium, the man under the personal reign of Christ. Now, I want to define something, and I'm not sure if it's in my notes here or not, but I want to clarify something with this. Many times we'll read in the scripture, we'll read about the kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of God. And a lot of people think those two things are synonymous or one and the same, but they're not. The kingdom of God is a spiritual kingdom. Okay, when you got saved, you became part of the kingdom of God. Did you become part of the kingdom of heaven? Not yet. You say, why? Because the kingdom of heaven is a literal, physical kingdom under the reign of Jesus Christ. Guess what the millennium is? That's the kingdom of heaven. That's it. So, I wanted to make sure we had that clarified, okay, so people understand that. Now, during this time, it begins at the end of the tribulation with the battle of Megiddo. That's when the blood runs as deep as the horse's bridles and all that fun stuff, okay? Yeah, when Jesus Christ comes back, right? I've never been good on a horse, but one of these days, Brother Leonard, I will be. <laughs> Make the Lone Ranger look like a saddle tramp. There you go. And you know what? We'll be riding one-handed because we'll have a sword in one hand and the reins in the other hand. The word millennium does not appear in Scripture. The word is from the Greek milo, meaning thousand, and anno, meaning year. Therefore, millennium, or the thousand-year reign of Christ. One thousand years. And we'll be here. You say, who will we be ruling and reigning over? those that endured to the end of the trib. It ends with the battle of Gog and Magog and the doom of Satan. And eternity would begin directly after the millennium. This would include the destruction of the heavens and the earth as we know it, the creation of a new heaven and earth, and the New Jerusalem. See Revelation 21 and 22. Now, this is something that is really a mind blower. And I want you to catch this, okay? Very important that you catch this. Where is hell? Right now, where is hell? It's in the center of the earth, according to Scripture. All right? So, you're not too far from hell. But you know what's great? For a Listen to me right now. For a Christian, this is as close to hell as you're ever going to get. But for a lost person, this is as close to heaven as they're ever going to get, unless they accept Christ. But, when, but we say this all the time. They go to hell for all eternity. But here, in this passage, what happens to the earth? The heavens and earth? Well, where does hell go? At the great white throne judgment, what happens? The dead are judged, and hell gives up the dead that were in it. And then what happened, Brother Dean? They're cast into the lake of fire. So it makes good preaching, but what happens is they get out of hell, they're judged, and then put in the lake of fire. It's kind of like from the frying pan into the fire. That's a scary thought, isn't it? And then after this, after the millennium, we enter into eternity future. Clear as mud, right? Then? No, sir. Absolutely not. That's it. No in between. Two floors, up or down. That's it.
Purgatory is a creation of the Catholic Church in order that people would pay indulgences for the church to raise money. How do you think the, how do you think the Vatican was built? It was built by selling indulgences to pray people out of purgatory. Hebrew, I take care of that every morning, I promise. <laughs> okay, any questions? I'm sorry it took a little long, but there was so much information, and I hope you all really got a blessing out of it. I really do. Uh, now, let me say this, and I'll be done. This is not the end of ending point of dispensational study. This is your beginning point. It's your responsibility to take what I've given you and to build upon it. Line upon line, precept upon precept, here a little and there a little. Years ago when I graduated from seminary, one of my mentors, my pastor at the time, whose last name happened to be Estep as well, his name was Greg Estep. He's in glory now. And I love that man to death. But he told me this. He sent me out to pastor my first church, to start my first church, and he said this. He said, David, he said, don't take what I've taught you and what you've learned in seminary over the years as the ending point. Always remember, it's the beginning point. He said, take what you've learned, build upon it, learn more, that you might be able to teach other people even more than I've taught you. That's it. That's it. That's just that quick. Just that quick. All right, folks, I hope you got a blessing tonight. I've enjoyed teaching, and I hope it's something that will be a help and a benefit to you over the years as you read your Bible. It will. These things that I'm teaching you over the next several weeks will open your Bible up to you, I promise you, and it will be a blessing to you from here out. Mm-hmm. That's it. That's it. All right, let's stand and we'll pray and we'll go to the house. If you haven't met my son and his wife, they're with us tonight with Michael and Sarah. He's the one who looks just like me, so uh, <laughs> if you can't tell, but uh, he's a little younger. He, yeah, he's a little younger. His hair's black. Mine used to be that color, but <laughs> anyway, let it grow a little bit. It will be. All right. I'm going to ask Michael to pray for us and dismiss us. Would you, Mike? Yeah.